All right, uh, welcome back everybody and those who just joined, welcome to the ECDI Swedish Council of Finance Stockholm School of Economics Conference on Sustainability and Corporate Governance. Uh, we will now do one session at a time with a short break in between. Uh, the format is that there's uh, an author of a piece of research who will present it. And then there is a discussant who will discuss it. And then there's a little bit of time at the end, potentially, for the presenter to maybe comment. Also, if you have questions from the audience, all the participants are welcome to enter it through the Q&A function of Zoom. And then if there's time at the end, I will be happy to read out a few of those questions. And so I can moderate that at the end if we have time. So please feel free to enter questions there. Uh, okay, without further ado, I'm gonna hand over to Lucian Pepchuk who um, is presenting joint work with Roberto Talarita on the illusory promise of stakeholder governance. And Lucian, I will intervene verbally when you have five minutes or so left, just to uh, remind you. Otherwise, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Bo. Uh, delighted uh, to be here. Uh, the motivation uh, for this work doesn't uh, require uh, too much uh, discussion. Uh, uh, as uh, all of you know, there is growing support for what we call uh, quote unquote stakeholderism. The view that corporate leaders should give weight uh, to the well being not just of stakeholders, but of shareholders. Uh, sorry, not, uh, not just of shareholders, but also of uh, stakeholders in, in, at large. Uh, and should uh, give weight to them when they make business decisions. Examples of this growing support, many of you know, is the business roundtable statement from a year ago in the Davos World Economic Forum Manifesto on stakeholder capitalism, and there are uh, many other examples. We make uh, two main points. First, we claim that stakeholderism benefits are illusory. Stakeholderism should not be expected to produce material benefits for stakeholders. Second, not only we're not going to get benefits for stakeholders, but stakeholderism is going to impose substantial costs and embracing it uh, would uh, 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 be harmful uh, uh, to many groups, including stakeholders themselves. And therefore, our conclusion is that stakeholderism should be rejected, including by those who take shareholder interests seriously. And I want to say a word about us uh, being uh, among those who give a lot of weight to stakeholder interests. There are some opponents of stakeholderism who oppose it because they believe that market forces or contracts are sufficiently uh, 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 protective of stakeholder interests. However, we, like many uh, supporters of stakeholder capitalism, uh, we believe and we assume for the purpose of our analysis that the externalities that corporations impose on stakeholders raise substantial concerns. But the reason why we come uh, out against stakeholder capitalism is that we conclude that it would not provide a good way for addressing those concerns. Indeed, it would be counterproductive. And what we need are external laws, regulations, and policies, things like carbon tax or labor protective measures those things, rather than counting on the discretion of corporate leaders, corporate leaders should be the focus of those who care about stakeholders like uh, our discussants, uh, uh, Colin and ourselves. We should at the outset distinguish between two versions of stakeholderism. Uh, what is often referred to as a light and shorter value, 
Under this view, corporate leaders should simply recognize that treating stakeholders is useful and often facilitates long-term value maximization. Under this version of stakeholderism, consideration of stakeholder interest is simply a means, that's why we call it instrumental stakeholderism, it's just a means to share the value maximization. And therefore this version is not conceptually or operationally different from shareholder value maximization. The version that is conceptually different and the one that calls for most attention uh, is what we call pluralistic stakeholderism, which uh, uh, treats stakeholder welfare not just as an instrument, but rather as an end in itself and believe that corporate leaders should have a plurality of independent ends and must balance uh, uh, those uh, uh, interests of the various constituencies. Let me start by saying a, a few words about the business roundtable statement. Um, because when it was issued about a year ago, it was widely described as a major milestone, was uh, uh, portrayed in the media as a major philosophical shift that breaks with decades of long-held corporate orthodoxy. But in our paper, we provide various pieces of evidence that suggest that the statement was mostly for show rather than a signal of changing attitudes or of coming shifts in the treatment of stakeholders. Uh, just to illustrate, here are two pieces of evidence. One is uh, uh, we conducted a survey, we contacted the public relations officers of all the companies whose CEO signed the business roundtable statement to inquire whether the joining of the statement was approved or ratified by the board because things that are significant generally are brought to the board for approval or ratification. And we found out that all but one company did not have uh, the endorsement of the business roundtable either approved or ratified by the board, which to us is consistent with the internal perception that the statement didn't really require any meaningful changes in how stakeholders are going to be treated. Another piece of evidence is we reviewed uh, uh, more than 150 corporate governance guidelines that are approved by the board and that every public company has. And uh, the review indicated that still at this point in time, even though a very large number of companies updated their corporate governance guidelines since the statement was issued, the language of those guidelines is still very much reflecting a commitment to share their privacy. And anyone who's interested in this, there are several additional pieces of evidence uh, in the paper that support the view uh, uh, that the business roundtable statement was mostly for show. But I don't want to dwell on this because putting aside the business roundtable statement for us as academics, the more important question is, broadly speaking, should we expect stakeholderism to protect stakeholders beyond what would serve uh, our shareholders. And because stakeholderism relies so critically on the discretion of corporate leaders, to answer this question, we need to resolve whether corporate leaders have incentives to benefit stakeholders beyond what would be good for shareholders. So in the paper, we uh, uh, conduct an analysis uh, looking both at the theory and uh, the evidence, including some evidence that we put forward. We look at the 
various elements like compensation, the labor market, the market for corporate control. And we conclude that there is a robust link between the interest of corporate leaders and shareholders, maybe not as close in alignment as uh, uh, scholars of corporate governance would like uh, uh, to see, but there is a robust link. And by contrast, the interests of CEOs and directors are not robustly linked with the interests of stakeholders. And therefore, an incentive analysis suggests that corporate leaders don't, not only they don't have incentives, they have incentives not to protect stakeholders beyond the point that doing so would serve shorter value maximization. We next go to examine empirically whether the past behavior of corporate leaders was consistent with this incentives conclusion. And we argue that a good setting for doing those tests is to look at the acquisition of companies in the large number of states in the US uh, uh, where acquisitions are governed by constituency statutes, which do exactly what stakeholders would like to have is they authorize corporate leaders to take into account the interest of stakeholders and not only shareholders when they are considering a sale. And we look uh, at all the sales to private equity in the last two decades that were governed by such statutes. And uh, the paper presents evidence for the largest deals and we have a companion paper for whom corporate leaders bargain that analyzes in detail each and every uh, uh, transaction in this large set. What do we find? We find that corporate leaders bargained substantially and with good results for shareholders obtaining large premiums for them and for corporate leaders themselves obtaining both monetary payoffs and continued employment for themselves. But for whom corporate leaders did not bargain, even though the statutes expected and authorized them to do so, they did not negotiate uh, uh, at all for any constraints on the post-deal freedom of the buyer to fire employees, even though protection of labor was often cited as a major reason for the adoption of constituency statutes, and even though there is evidence that, in fact, there, are, there is significant reduction of employment after such sales. They did not negotiate for any protection of suppliers, customers, uh, uh, and creditors, other stakeholder groups that are often mentioned, or uh, for the environment. And other than very few cases where there were cosmet cosmetic and legally unenforceable pledges, there were no protection for headquarter communities uh, uh, and uh, against removal of headquarters. What should, what lesson should we draw from uh, this evidence? Uh, we argue that stakeholders must wrestle with the failure of constituency statutes trying to identify the reasons why those statutes did not deliver and examine whether the same reasons would also not undermine stakeholderism. Because as many of us know, uh, uh, George Santayana warned us a century ago that those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it and stakeholderism should avoid uh, such uh, pitfalls. Uh, in our companion paper, we analyze in detail potential explanations for the failure of constituency statutes. We conclude that the most plausible explanation was rooted in the incentives of corporate leaders and that stakeholderism should also be expected to fail to deliver because of the very same incentives. But we look also at alternatives for example, might it be that the statutes did not deliver because corporate leaders needed to gain uh, 
show the word of approval. We find this is not plausible because we show that protections were largely absent, even in the subset of deals where this wasn't a constraint because the premium was large and the approval was approved by a very large margin over what was required. And in any event, shareholders' exclusive voting power should also be expected to constrain the ability of stakeholderism to deliver value. An alternative explanation, uh, uh, and Colin in his uh, uh, response, in his recent response uh, uh, to our uh, paper that uh, people who are interested in the subject might want uh, to read, uh, he wonders whether we can learn much from this experience because maybe the failure of the statute was due to the shorter focus norms that prevailed in the past, but may be no longer dominate. But we document that corporate leaders did not deliver any value to stakeholders, not just uh, uh, in prior decades, but also in all the deals in the last three to five years in which pro-stakeholder rhetoric was very uh, strong. The question then arises, uh, uh, maybe we could fix incentives. We took the existing system of incentives as given uh, for part of our analysis because stakeholderists, you can look at the business roundtable or the Davis manifesto, you see that they advocate relying on the discretion of corporate leaders without changing other basic corporate law rules like uh, shareholders' voting power. But it might be argued, and then Colin uh, 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 wonders about this in his uh, uh, paper, uh, that even if stakeholderism as currently put forward, uh, cannot be expected to benefit stakeholders. We should, as academics, focus on identifying and designing a broad reform, including some supplemental measures that would enable stakeholderism to benefit stakeholders. So in our paper, we conduct an analysis of whether this would happen if we supplemented stakeholderism with either a redesign of pay arrangements by tying them very much to ESG metrics or by having stakeholders participate in voting on director elections. And we conclude that both types of supplemental measures would be very difficult to implement, would impose large costs, and that the benefits that they would produce for stakeholders would be doubtful and at a minimum limited. So therefore, this leads us to conclude that stakeholders should not proceed with advocating acceptance of stakeholderism until they put forward a concrete plan that would fix those incentives for them. Until now, I focused on explaining why stakeholderism would not fail, would fail to deliver benefits to the purported beneficiaries, the stakeholders. But some of you might wonder, perhaps it wouldn't, uh, it could only be a plus, maybe it would produce uh, a significant benefit, but it can only move us in a positive direction. And our conclusion is the opposite. Uh, we show that acceptance of stakeholderism would produce two major costs. One cost is that stakeholderism should be expected to increase the insulation of corporate leaders from stakeholders and make corporate leaders less accountable. And that can be, that can be expected to happen uh, in two ways. First of all, stakeholderism is already used as a basis for urging institutional investors to be more differential to corporate leaders, uh, less willing to support hedge fund activists, and more accepting of governance arrangements that shield management from shorter pressure. 
And also, stakeholderism is used as a basis for urging policymakers to support legal reforms that would insulate corporate leaders from shareholders. Indeed, uh, we are especially concerned about this prospect of insulation because for reasons we described in the paper, it seems that the prospect of obtaining such insulation might be at least partly motivating the support for stakeholderism that comes from some corporate leaders and their advisors. Uh, for them, uh, a support for stakeholderism may well be strategic. It's an attempt to take us back to the era, to the era of managerialism and to get back a managerialist agenda but dressed up in the clothes of stakeholder protection. The other large cost that we are concerned about is people like Colin or ourselves, politicians all over the world, there is a growing recognition that corporate externalities are meaningful and there is substantial and growing demand for policies, laws, regulations that would address those problems. And we argue that the wide array of potential policy reforms that could be imposed on corporations from the outside and that would provide real benefits to stakeholderism, those could be somewhat discouraged or impeded or chilled by acceptance of stakeholderism. And that could result uh, uh, for two reasons. First of all, that to the extent that the, accept the acceptance of stakeholderism leads to illusory hopes that corporate leaders are going to protect stakeholders on their own, then those expectations uh, uh, could have two adverse consequences. One is they would reduce the effort of those who care about stakeholders uh, 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 to focus on external regulation. Uh, and also it would make uh, uh, many lawmakers and policy makers less re receptive to such external constraints on grounds that let's first see with their private ordering and corporate leaders of their own are solving the problems. To illustrate, uh, um, a recent statement by dozens of academics that you can find on SSRN uh, uh, argues, among other things, that with less than a decade left in which to address the catastrophic threat of climate change, and with many having a shared sense of urgency, now is the time to act to reform corporate governance. And we strongly disagree, even though we share this sense of urgency, because we believe that those who share this sense of urgency should be focused on things like say carbon tax that could make uh, uh, a difference. And if they focus on reforming corporate governance and especially on advancing stakeholderism, uh, uh, we are going to find ourselves uh, 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 in 10 years uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, excessively close and uh, having missed uh, uh, some opportunities to address this catastrophic threat. Uh, let me uh, just add uh, maybe a couple of notes to put this, uh, our work in perspective. Uh, we do not focus on this uh, in this paper, but uh, I plan to do it in, in subsequent work, on the extent to which shareholders and institutional investors should be guided in their stewardship uh, by attempts to induce companies uh, to uh, provide benefits to stakeholders. Um, 
and there is, as you know, a lot of work on this question. For our purposes, we take as given that it is desirable, either because the shareholders are unwanted or because it's important for society to improve the protection of stakeholders. Our problem is that stakeholderism uh, is not the way to go about achieving this outcome, whether it's one that stakeholders, uh, whether it's one that institutional investors desire or society. Uh, and also we do not analyze directly ESG-focused stewardship, our conclusions have clear implications for this stewardship, namely, to the extent that institutional investors want to advance stakeholder interests, perhaps pressing some particular specific actions might produce such benefits, but supporting stakeholderism or supporting statements of corporate purpose or pursuing anything else in the form of stakeholderism that in the end relies on the discretion of corporate leaders to deliver the goods is not going to be an effective way uh, 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 to do so. Um, maybe if I, uh, Maybe let me also make a very quick note to place our work in the context of the uh, uh, substantial debate on the social responsibility of business uh, in connection with the uh, 50 year anniversary of Milton Friedman's uh, uh, um, seminar essay. So we differ, we very much differ from uh, uh, Friedman's inclination attitude because we view corporate externalities on stakeholders as a first order concern. It does not seem to be uh, greatly concerned about this issue. Uh, but even though we view the current consequences of capitalism differently from him, uh, we do not want to change capitalism in the way of giving corporate leaders discretion to mitigate the problems that it arises, what we would like is to constrain capitalism from the outside for external rules and regulation. Around we were, five minutes left. Sure, I just used two of them. Uh, thanks, Bo. Uh, part, we recognize that part of the appeal of stakeholderism is that it seemingly provides a quote-unquote private ordering solution to the problems of capitalism. It seems to harness corporations which have been a powerful engine of, of economic growth to the benefit of stakeholders. But corporations have been successful in their economic missions due to in their incentives of the corporate leaders and relying on corporate leaders to produce societal benefits for which we don't really have right now a plan to provide them an incentives to do so, while weakening the incentives that have enabled them to work well in other areas, that's not the way to go. So let me uh, 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 conclude by just reminding you of our two main points that the benefits of stakeholderism are illusory because benefits for stakeholders are not, should not be expected to arise. And that the potential costs of stakeholderism, including for the protection of stakeholders themselves, are large indeed. Thank you both. I yield my, the rest of my time. Yes, thank you. The discussion is Colin Mayer. Uh, Colin, will you share slides as well? Okay, wait, you're muted. Let's unmute. No, I'm not going to use any slides. Perfect. Thank you very much, Bo. <clears throat> My good friend Lucian and I have already 
debated this fascinating paper at great length. It's an excellent oversight and summary of the issues and the debate on stakeholders and shareholders. So to avoid boring my friend, my friends frequently say that is exactly what I do. That's why they are my friends. I'll not repeat my previous comments, but my re restrict myself to some new ones. So how should one judge whether the promotion of stakeholder interests beyond shareholder interests is beneficial? The conventional way is to look at the impact on a company's share price and return to shareholders. For example, there's much evidence of a positive association between employee satisfaction and share prices as reported, for example, by Alex Edmonds and Jan Emanuel Denaer. The absence of such a positive relation would be interpreted by critics of stakeholder theories as evidence of a failure of stakeholder interests to deliver beneficial outcomes. And a positive relation is interpreted by critics like Lucian as evidence that, that it is no more than enlightened shareholder interest. Heads you win, tails I lose. So what evidence can be elicited to demonstrate that the promotion of stakeholder interests is desirable? This raises the question of what we're actually trying to do and how we should judge success. As I'll describe it, it's a question that Lucian's paper never addresses, let alone answers. So unfortunately, this paper, fascinating though it is, is devoid of either conceptual or empirical content. The evidence on the failure of the business round table signatories to uphold their promises is, even according to Lucian's interpretation, not remotely surprising. My interpretation of the business round table statement from the outset was that it was in Lucian's terms, enlightened shareholder interest. And I explicitly heard many members describe it at a meeting of their CEOs and chairs as reflecting what that uh, business uh, guru, Jim Collins described as being the genius of the end, looking after their stakeholders and creating long-term value for their shareholders. They saw no trade-off and saw their role as remaining within the confines of shareholder primacy while reinforcing their commitment to their stakeholders in so doing. So they saw no need to consult their boards, change their governance statements on their websites or shift their state of incorporation from Delaware. So what should one conclude from this? Well, I think the answer is not much because all that it demonstrates is that shareholder primacy reigns supreme in the US. And one doesn't change an economic system by simply announcing one's going to change one's behavior. Is that news? Not really. Is that interesting? Not a great deal. And Lucian himself provides persuasive evidence on why this should not come as any surprise. Directors and CEOs that support shareholder interests are more likely to keep their jobs and get new ones. They are less likely to be subject to proxy fights, hostile takeover bids, hedge fund activist interventions, and therefore loss of their jobs and salary. CEOs' salaries are much more closely tied to share prices and returns than any non-financial measure. In a shareholder primacy system, the shareholder who pays the piper calls the shareholder value tune. The system is stacked against directors and CEOs trying to do anything else. And the failure of constitution statutes to provide protection to stakeholders in private equity acquisitions of companies incorporated in constituency statute states says no more than the inadequacy of constituency statutes to offer effective protection in an economy where shareholder primacy reigns supreme. And it's not surprising 
when you look at the statues. Take this one from Minnesota, which reads as follows. A director may, in considering the best interests of the corporation, consider the interests of the corporation's employees, customers, suppliers, and creditors, the economy of the state and nation, community and societal considerations, and the long-term as well as short-term interests of the corporation and its shareholders, including the possibility that these interests might be best served by the continuing independence of the corporation. What sort of a commitment device is that? Apart from being verbiage, it sounds pretty close to the UK Companies Act and indeed any shareholder or enlightened shareholder interest law. And notice that the statement at the beginning is May. There's no obligation whatsoever. It's not a must. May is mush. Must might have cast some muster. Lucian argues that it's impossible to change the system and in particular to relate incentives to non-financial measures of performance. That's a curious statement from someone sitting in one of the strongest incentive dri driven academic institutions in the world where all of the metrics on which it's based are non-financial. Of course, he'll argue that business is different, only it isn't. Anyone who's worked in a business knows that the vast proportion of the metrics by which people's performance are judged are non-financial. Sales, customer satisfaction, collegiality, teamsmanship, etc. Lucian talks about climate and the fact that there are many ways of measuring a company's impact, CO2 emissions, global warming. But those are exactly the measures against which increasingly financial institutions managing not just one company, but multiple companies are being evaluated. They in turn will put increasing pressure on companies to do the same and exercise their business judgment in making the resulting trade-offs. Finally, he argues this is all just a smokescreen, a diversionary tactic for avoiding what really would help stakeholders, namely regulation. But what world is Lucian living in? If regulation could and had internalized externalities, do we really think that we'd be fretting about climate change, diversity and inclusion? Does he recognize the problems that the globalization of companies such as Google and Facebook presents for designing effective regulation? The illusion is not one of the potential for reform, but the potential for the absence of reform and relying on the status quo. What the paper entirely fails to do is to provide any evidence on the potential for change and the fact that there are very different systems around the world that promote very different types of corporate conduct and balances of interest in companies. But it's not just that the paper provides no evidence on the question that needs to be answered. Still more seriously, it suggests no way of evaluating whether such a change is desirable. What is good for Lucy? He clearly is genuinely concerned about stakeholder as well as shareholder interest. But he offers no way of judging whether the shareholder primacy model with regulation delivers that. And many people think it doesn't and believe that other systems could do better. And with good reason, because corporations are products of the law and therefore can be created in whatever form the law wishes them to take. The fact that it's perfectly possible to establish publicly promoting corporations is evidenced by the fact that that is exactly how they were constituted and operated for several centuries around the world, including in the US as documented at the beginning of Lucian and Roberto's paper. The question is not whether it's possible, but whether it's desirable. And on this, the paper has nothing to say because it provides no criteria by which to judge this. 
There's nothing in the paper that speaks about the feasibility of another system or provides a basis on which to judge whether another system does better. Is it shareholder wealth, total wealth, shareholder welfare, total welfare? This paper is simply a description of the existing US system and the presumption, but with no evidence that it could not be bettered. He could do better, we can do better, and we must do better because we almost certainly will need to do so very soon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so if I, I follow that correctly, you don't agree with everything Lucian said. Uh, so let's give Lucian a, a chance to discuss this. Uh, we have about six minutes or maybe a few sure. more. And there are a couple of questions in the Q&A. So you decide, Lucian, how much time you want to spend okay. on, on Colin. And if you want, I will read you questions from the Q&A. Sure. Yeah, thanks a lot, Bo. And thanks, uh, Pauline, for uh, your comments, which, as usual, are delivered with uh, a great eloquence. Uh, so uh, a quick uh, reaction. There was a lot in what you say. One is we don't say uh, uh, what is our objective or uh, uh, we might be focusing on shorter value. No, we make it, we try to make it clear and let me state it uh, here that we start from the assumption that it's important to protect the interest of stakeholders. You can think about us as being in economics a social planner who wants to have a system that maximizes social welfare. So in that we are with you. But the question is, how do we maximize social welfare? And I agree with you that we can design corporate law rules any way we want, but it doesn't follow that the way to maximize social welfare is to tell corporate leaders you'll be the benevolent dictator and we give you discretion and we count on you to uh, maximize social wealth. Secondly, uh, you agreed uh, uh, with us that uh, uh, maybe not much should have been expected from the business roundtable. I note here that uh, uh, there were there was a massive number of observers which we cite that regarded uh, uh, this as a major historic milestone. So at least for them, our evidence uh, might be helpful. Uh, but your uh, view was, look, the BRT, the constituency statutes, I'm not surprised. They're not going to deliver because there isn't anything tight there. There is a lot of mush and people don't have incentives. And here we completely agree with you. The problem is that when I look at the literature of the people who put forward stakeholderism, including uh, uh, your own valuable work, it's not clear to me that the system you provide at this uh, point does not suffer from those problems, is it? Uh, having corporations articulate the corporate purpose by which the public might judge them? Is that going to provide uh, uh, a tight constraint? You mentioned uh, uh, that we haven't shown that it's not possible to design a good stakeholderism system. We have tried in our paper to see whether you can do it through changing the voting rules and compensation. But I actually urge you, Colin, as someone who believes in stakeholderism, is why don't you put forward a concrete, detailed plan of how you get stakeholderism to work in a way that is grounded in incentive and is tied in, in the ways that you as an economist recognize is necessary to deliver its benefits. And once you have uh, uh, such uh, uh, a plan, we can uh, 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 think about it. And uh, uh, um, even though we haven't been able to come up with one, 
surely uh, it might be possible. We are not excluding it. And once you have a plan, we'll look at it and we'll think about it. But what I urge you, because of the large cost of the illusory hopes, is not to push stakeholderism until you have the kind of plan that seems to be necessary uh, 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 based on your own comments for those things to work. And the last two reactions, let me just say, uh, the last two reactions are the following. You mentioned the one concrete proposal you mentioned was let's use ESG metrics. We put in the paper several reasons why it's very difficult to do it with ESG metrics. We know, many of the people in this conference have worked on executive compensation, we know how difficult it is to design perfectly executive compensation, even for the simple objective of shorted value. With respect to stakeholder uh, uh, metrics, there is first of all the problem of the multitude of stakeholders and combining them. And secondly, there is the problem of managers' private interest, which may mean that we have to worry that whoever is designing those metrics is not going to do it to benefit managers' payoffs, but rather to protect stakeholders and as long as the, so we need two things. One is good set of metrics and two, a good system for overseeing the design of those compensation arrangements based on metrics. And uh, we conclude in the paper that both things are very difficult. If you come up with a plan, it would be great. Last comment and a quick reaction. You as well as others are uh, kind of concerned about the fact that we have political gridlock and some things are difficult to get through regulation. And you say various companies are fighting against regulation and their vested interest in, the, in a way. And there's a little bit of a tension in this argument. Why? Because the very corporate leaders who are spending massive corporate resources to fight against regulation, you would like to count on their discretion to protect stakeholders. The two things do not live with each other uh, well. And we also recognize that politics is a difficult route, but our conclusions about stakeholderism are that this is the only route that can provide meaningful progress. And we do have some laws and regulations in each of those areas, not enough, I agree with you, but we have them on the books. And the chances of us making progress in this direction might be chilled if people uh, 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 um, come to the view that we can rely on corporate leaders, or at least we should give a chance for stakeholderism to deliver benefits in the next 10, 20 years before we take other action to save the planet, combat inequality and so forth. Let me stop here. Well, Lucien, we have set out a specific plan in the British Academy Future of the Corporation Program, which sets out what one's trying to do and how one gets there. And it's around the notion of corporate purposes as solving problems in profitable ways. And the measures for doing that are not the current ESG. Everyone recognizes the deficiency with those. What is being designed at present is a set of coherent uh, uh, measures that can be adopted by companies that would not be at their discretion as to what they choose to do. And secondly, to design a, an accounting system uh, and you say, well, it's impossible to do that. People were saying exactly the same thing about the introduction of a financial accounting system after the great crash and the, at the beginning of the 1930s. It will happen and it has to happen. And furthermore, it's not a matter 
of regulation having been watered down by the corporate sector. It's a matter of aligning interests of corporations so that the regulations that are put in place are those that promote purposes that are uh, societally focused on those companies where it's appropriate to do so. Other companies should be able to choose their purpose. Yes, just a quick reaction, if Bo will allow me. If the concrete plan is uh, 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 the one that is in your writings about corporate purpose and uh, in the project of the British Academy, then my own concern, and this is something we can cool later and perhaps we should add to our paper as well. My own concern is that what we have there does not uh, 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 enjoy advantages over what the uh, 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 constituency statutes try to do and does not have, uh, does not overcome the problem that you recognized before about incentives, about mushiness, about people trying to uh, 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 um, get away with uh, uh, sounding good, but not really uh, sacrificing much. My own uh, research, and I'll stop here because maybe there are questions we can uh, ask, is I've looked at the various companies that have adopted corporate purpose, and it's complete whoosh. Uh, uh, those uh, uh, statements generally do not provide a good yardstick uh, 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 that would enable us to keep corporate leaders' feet to the fire. Now, I'm sure that the project of the British Academy is also unhappy about the current bushy statements, would want to have statements uh, 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 that would be more uh, 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 effectively scooting us from the outside. So once will have a system that makes it completely necessary for people to have statements that can be externally from the outside scrutinized in a way that would make them accountable and provide them with clear incentives to do it. Currently, uh, 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 um, you know, with, uh, uh, with uh, deference to, uh, to your work on this. I'm not persuaded uh, 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 the uh, project of the British Academy uh, can deliver us to the Garden of Eden of stakeholder protection. Well, it can go a long way if you simply in corporate law replace may with must, and you measure outcomes not by the mushiness of the statement, by the, but by the... Yeah. Here, I do yes. and measure that before. Yes. We have two. Yeah, let me just say one bit. As a law professor, I, this is the one where if you just replace in the constituency statutes the word may with the word shall or ought or must, it would not have made any difference for two reasons. One, there are three statutes, as we mentioned in the paper, that have those words, no difference. And two, uh, uh, because of the way that uh, 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 courts defer to what managers decide, those things are aspirational. They are not enforceable, whether you say may or must, those are aspirational and norm setting. So you can say may, must, or even any stronger term in the English language, it would not have made a difference. And indeed, in the three states that have this word, no difference in outcome. Let me stop here. So this, uh, this reminds me of what happens when I tell my students that they must prepare some <laughs> text before class the next day. It kind of works on some, but not on others. Um, sorry, on a more serious note, I want to thank you both for a very uh, interesting and lively discussion. It has been great to have you here. We ate up the break. So if Ian is ready, I want to hand over to the next paper right away with no, no Q&A and no further discussion.
although perhaps uh, there is the opportunity to discuss these issues in Lucian's paper in other contexts.